Hi, my name is Jim Shear. I'm a physical therapist. Uh, I've been treating CRPS for eight or nine years. Um, we're going to look at how to progress people. And we're also going to do present like a case study on how I presented two individuals, how I um, got two individuals back to work um, with CRPS. And they came in quite disabled and we just progressed them. And how do we progress? Them? Um, the purpose of this presentation is to, to show you what's possible. Um, most people with CRPS, we can make uh, a significant improvement in their quality of life. So their quality of life uh, will improve and we will show some functional gains. Um, sometimes these functional gains can be really large. Sometimes they're small, um, but their quality of life will definitely improve with physical therapy and um, other therapies. We can do a lot. And we're gonna we're just gonna show you these two cases just to kind of give you an example of that. So how do we do this? Um, I really believe in a multimodal um, approach to CRPS. So I think that a multidisciplinary approach is best for the treatment of CRPS. Um, the things we're gonna focus on in on here are physical therapy um, interventions. Um, so the three that we're going to pay the most attention to are pain neuroscience education, pacing, and graded exposure. And we'll go over those in the next couple of slides. So pain neuroscience education, it's a form of cognitive behavioral therapy, and it's been done by physical therapists since uh, 2002. It really started with... Um, a book by, uh, by David Butler, um, Explain the Pain. Um, and that's, that's when that kind of whole movement started out of Australia. And now it's spread and it's really, the research is just growing and growing and growing on it. Um, the goal of it is to uh, de-threaten pain. So there's a lot of catastrophizing, there's a lot of fear avoidance, there's a lot of other factors that come up, come up um, depression and anxiety that come up as a result of the pain. And that's that's the individual's reaction to the pain. And although it's hard, we can we can lessen those factors. And education is a good way to do that. So understanding that uh, that pain doesn't mean that you're damaging yourself, understanding that pain doesn't mean that it's going to get worse in the future. Um, and understanding your pain, it, it unlocks the brain a little bit um, and it helps it helps um, calm down the nervous system. It helps release those natural opioids um, that are in the brain. So it unlocks kind of the drug cabinet in the brain. There's a lot of natural opioids that are produced in the brain. Um, <clears throat> and when we're afraid, and when we think there's danger in the world around us, we, we shut down that drug cabinet. That drug cabinet's not open to us. Um, and we, we tell the body that, yes, it does need to be in pain. And the, the brain sends, it doesn't, it doesn't inhibit any of that. So understanding pain is the first step. Uh, so there is a measurable response in the brain to pain neuroscience education. So this is 25 minutes of pain neuroscience education. Um, and this is the effect that it can have. So what we're looking at is in this top column um, or top row, uh, row A um, right here. We see um, a dancer, she's gonna have, she's had uh, back pain for years and years and years, and she's gonna have back surgery in a couple of days. And she's just laying in the, the MRI machine and the fMRI machine, we're looking at her brain and she's not doing anything. The second column right here, they asked her to do a painful movement. I believe it was a pelvic tilt. So they said, <clears throat> they said, um, Go ahead and just tilt your pelvis back and forth. And she experiences pain with that. And we watch what areas of the brain lit up and what areas of the brain had blood flow. And you see all this activity in the brain. Um, that's what this is. this is. This is the representation of the blood flow in the brain. And this is an indication there's uh, activity going on there. So you see all this activity right there. The researchers that are physical therapists took her out of the uh, fMRI machine and they educated her on uh, pain. So they educated her on um, what causes your pain, um, 
pain doesn't mean damage. Um, it doesn't mean things are getting worse. Your nerves can be extra sensitive. Even with something like chronic low back pain, your nerves can be sensitized. So that's not unique just to CRPS. CRPS just has some extra elements to it. And they stuck her back in the fMRI machine and they had her do this pelvic tilt again. And the change that we see is we don't see all this activity. So she's doing the same painful movement that she was doing before, and you just see a lot less activity. What we think this is, is we think this is all the, the fear and catastrophizing. So, you know, in this upper picture, she's going, this hurts, I'm, I'm damaging my tissue. Um, I wonder if it's gonna get worse. Um, should I really be doing this? Um, in here, we've, you know, after talking to her, I would, I would imagine that the thoughts are more like, okay, I'm having some pain, but that's okay. And there's less of this catastrophizing going on. There's less of this, um, less of this ruminating and hypervigilance uh, over, over what's going on in her back. She's just like, there's pain and that's okay. So it really does change the brain pretty quickly, 25 minutes. Um, and I suck her back in, and this is the difference in brain activity. And this was done by a physical therapist, not a psychologist. Next, we're gonna talk about pacing. So pacing is the idea of taking breaks. <clears throat> um, it's kind of the antithesis to no pain, no gain. Um, it's, we're staying in the sore but safe uh, <clears throat> realm of things. So we wanna do a little bit of activity that's irritating, and then we wanna back off. Um, and we just want the pain to kind of undulate back and forth. Um, we don't want to keep having it climb because then it hits it hits that flare up zone over there. So we do 10 to 30 seconds of activity, um, often when we start. Um, if I haven't had someone standing, um, yeah, I'll have them stand for five seconds, sit down. And they may stand for five seconds and then sit down for 20 or 30 seconds. Sometimes the break periods when we start with people are longer than the activity periods. Um, as we go on, these rest breaks can become shorter and they become they can become less frequent. So this isn't forever that we're doing 10 seconds of activity. This is this is the beginning with. Then we'll do five, 10 minutes, and then eventually we'll get back to 30 minutes of activity without a rest. We can um, amplify this a little bit more by doing some kind of relieving activity during the uh, rest period. So I'll have people focus on relaxing in between. So we just have Okay, deep breath into your stomach, slow exhale, do five, 10 breaths of that, and then resume the activity. I think that's really, I don't think there's a lot of research between behind doing that. I think there's research on pacing, but not doing active relaxation, but I think that's really helpful. Um, so function-based, um, we're looking at um, graded exposure here, and we're looking at um, increasing kind of functional activities um, with this and how to how to in, increase that. Um, we're gonna look at uh, we're look at mirror box to start with. Um, this is kind of the end of graded motor imagery. Um, so there's three steps to graded motor imagery that we're not gonna go over. But there's laterality, um, there's um, imagining movement, and then there's finally there's mirror box. And you're looking at the unaffected side. So um, Verena is a physical therapy student, and she's going to be watching the left leg that we're calling the um, the healthy leg, and the, the right leg is her CRPS leg. Um, in this example, and she's going to be watching the movement with her left side. So she's just watching in the mirror, her left side move. I will have people flare up with this at times. if They really have not used the, uh, um, the affected side um, often. They, they can't have a flare up. So she starts with just movement of the, of the left. And then we might throw in pain-free movement. So she's noticed she's doing a little bit less movement with the right and big, large movements with the left, um, kind of mirroring that movement. And then we up the intensity level and the threat level um, of what she's watching in the mirror. Okay. 
and then we progress to moving the right leg. This can take months. This 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 can take a month or two to to progress to here. So you know this isn't this isn't quick. I'm just showing you all the steps and how we go through it. And then again, we're not slamming this down hard at this point, but that's where we'd progress to next. We're going to look at um, starting to do more weight bearing. <clears throat> so this would be an individual that um, hasn't put any weight on the foot at all. Um, and what we're doing is we're just putting a little bit of weight through the foot and then backing off. A little bit of weight through the foot, back off. I like using a scale like this um, because we can really measure it. Um, and then they can, they can change that as they go along. So if she were using crutches, um, these aren't the kind of crutches we'd like for some of the CRPS. Uh, we'd like ones that didn't, that had like a mesh top to them. But if you were using crutches. So we start non-weight bearing, then we start just putting a little bit of weight through it with both feet, with um, both crutches, I mean. And then more weight through it with the support of And this progression of activity can take months. You know, what you're seeing right here is not, this is not done in one session. Um, occasionally we get quick, quick results and we do get quick changes like that, but this is over months. We take away one of the crutches and now we're just using one crutch for support. And then finally, walking without crutches. Often we'll go, um, this won't be an all or none thing. This will be um, spend half your day without crutches. We're going to progress next to um, kind of jumping activities. Um, we're going to start with really, really light activities, and we're going to start jumping with both legs. Um, we might also start jumping with just the unaffected side. So again, low, low, low resistance. You can see there's not much going on here in terms of how, how hard she's hitting. This is still really scary if it's been years since you've done this. And now we've increased the resistance, right? And we're doing both feet, then we progress to one foot. And then we progress from um, doing that single leg on the on the jump board on the reformer um, to uh, to doing it on land, which is even more pressure, right? And I want you to notice we do like two or three jumps, and then we take a break and we let the symptoms calm down. So you know, even while we're doing graded exposure, we're we're kind of practicing pacing in it, and we'll do this for a while, and we'll we'll see how they do with it. Um, they, if the symptoms increase and they stay flared up, then we'll back off a little bit. But um, we just do this little, little, little exposure. And then after a while, after we've done that for a little bit and that seems fine, then we progress back to this. It's okay to have some pain during this, um, these activities. Um, I want the pain after a session to calm down within 24 hours. Um, that's kind of the upper limit is 24 hours. I'd really like it to um, calm down within 20 minutes to a couple hours afterwards. But if, if it's 24 hours that it took to calm back down, that's great. I want the same level of activity every day. And then we progress from like running to jumping. That seems really easy, this takes months. Okay, nerve stretching. So we're gonna talk about how to progress nerve stretching. I, I think nerve stretching, it's under-researched. Um, in the physical therapy literature with CRPS, I see very quick changes by doing um, nerve stretching. So we're going to start, remember her right leg is her affected side. 
So we're going to start with nerve sliders on the left. Um, we may start halfway through all this stuff. We're showing kind of from very low level of function um, up to higher level function. We may start in the middle. This is individualized. Um, we're just starting with the left and the unaffected side just to kind of show you um, how to progress when it's when it's a little more irritating. So we're flossing there. So she's tensioning that side, now tensioning over here. Tensioning, tensioning. Tensioning at the foot, tensioning at the back, relaxing the foot. So this is very, this isn't very aggressive at all. She's not doing um, tensioners, she's flossing. So tension, relax. And now she's tensioning on both sides. Again, on the unaffected foot and she's doing it herself, so that's a little less threatening. So now I'm gonna come in and stretch the foot. And again, we're saying that the right leg is the leg that she has CRPS on, and she doesn't have any symptoms in the left. So I'm coming in and cranking on that nerve, and I'm really cranking on, uh, And it doesn't feel very good, even with someone without symptoms. But I still haven't even progressed into the right leg yet. So after you know we've done that for a little bit, um, we'll uh, we'll start tensioning with the right leg, or we'll start doing um, sorry flossing with the right leg or sliders with the right leg. So we're still just flossing the nerve back and forth. Now we're tensioning. So she's pulling on both sides of the nerve, from the spinal cord and from um, sur sural and parietal nerves. And now I'm going to come in and tension the nerve. This can take weeks or months to do this. And some people, or, or sometimes this takes a couple visits and I start cranking on the nerve. It really depends on how they respond. Uh, with these nerve tensioners, some people, they, they get a little sore afterwards. So um, we, we go slowly, we, it's a little sore, we let it calm back down, we just do small amounts of it. Other people, they feel a lot better right after we do this. And so I'll progress them over two or three visits and we'll just be tensioning the nerve. Um, but some people will be doing this for months before I ever put my hand on the effect. Okay, so what we're going to look at um, now is kind of how to how to treat that allodynia and how we progress manual therapy um, with someone with CRPS. So again, we're going to start, we're saying that her right leg is her affected side. And we're going to start with light touch. We're also going to start with two-point discrimination um, and tactile discrimination, tactile discrimination has been shown to be superior over desensitization um, for, uh, for decreasing symptoms with CRPS. And tactile discrimination is um, you're doing like, you're identifying one point or two point, you're identifying different point sized objects, and then you're doing localization. Where in space is it that you're, um, that you're noticing it? I normally, you can have them draw it on a chart. I normally just have them tell me and tell them to try to visualize it. This can be enhanced by looking in the mirror. Uh, so they did some studies where, so we're gonna touch her unaffected side um, first, and we're gonna, or we're sorry, we're gonna touch the unaffected side and we're gonna do mirror therapy with her unaffected side. Then we're gonna progress to uh, tactile discrimination. So, sorry, I screwed up there. So we're touching the unaffected side, um, having her watch that in the mirror. Um, and we can be more aggressive with it. Remember, there's no pain in this left leg. We have her start touching the affected side. This is less threatening than me doing it. And now we're doing tactile discrimination training. So she's watching the unaffected side to get that image of the affected side instead of just hiding it. And we're having her um, identify that one point or two. 
point. Um, it, where is that on the foot? Now we're going into um, doing some joint mobilization. This, this whole process from going from touching the left foot to doing tactile discrimination to doing joint mobilization, this can take months. And we're kind of going through the whole gamut here of what we might do, but this months and months and months. This is not a quick process. Now what we're doing is we're doing tool assisted soft tissue mobilization. This is, again, I don't start with this. This is aggressive. Um, by the time we get there, we've already done a lot of soft tissue massage, maybe some joint manipulation or mobilization, and they're rubbing their foot um, on the daily. And it's this little metal instrument um, that we use for that. Um, anytime I do any kind of manual therapy, um, joint mobilization or soft tissue, I always have the patient do that at home. I don't want this to be some magical procedure that I'm doing in the clinic that they can't do in their home. It's really, really, really important for them to be able to do that on their own um, and to support that at home. And now um, I'd give her, I'd tell her to do this with like a butter knife. Now I'm having her do the tool assisted soft tissue movement. We don't start here. We don't start here. Again, we might start with mirror box, having them watch um, me or, them, or uh, themselves touch the other foot. And now we're doing what we call a cuboid whip. And that would kind of be one of the last things that we would do there, right? So we just really progress again from Look at what having them watch me touch the other side to touching the foot themselves. To tactile discrimination. To more aggressive touching and mobilization of the foot. And we just progress and this can take months. Um, so the ideal progression of mobilization and activity and light touch and all that stuff, the ideal would kind of be, um, this red line right here. So what we see is we just see these small little steps up. What you're going to see in the chart is, um, that I divided it into first day and early stage then middle stage, um, then late stage, um, you're going to see big steps. But that's not actually what we did or what we go for ideally. We just try to do really small little steps, kind of keep it there for a little bit, and then do another small little step up, keep it there for a little bit. And these are really, really small little steps, and it takes it takes a long time, you know, maybe 30 to 50 of these little stair steps um, over a period of time with uh, the CRPS. What happens in real life is not this nice little stair step pattern. Um, what we actually see is, uh, okay, we went up, it seems to be good, they got stressed out, or for no apparent reason whatsoever, we had a flare up, we had to back back down. Um, then we progress really well, all of a sudden. Um, medication changed, um, weather changed, just randomly they were doing better, and then we're able to progress a little bit more. Um, then we take another small little step up. <clears throat> things are going good. Things are going good. Um, oh, huge major flare up. Um, this is really important. This this always happens. Um, and this always happens when people are doing really well. Um, what happens is we're progressing and either randomly they do too much in their daily life. We do too much in physical therapy. Um, they have this major, major setback. Um, and I say major setback, but it's a major setback to them, but it's it's normally very short-lived. 
So their pain spikes, um, their symptoms get way worse. But this often, if we've had this nice progression this whole time, when we see this flare up, um, if they've been doing well for, for a couple of months, this doesn't last very long. Um, but this is where we have to educate people again. Okay, you're having a flare up, it's okay, we'll just progress back. We'll just progress back up here slowly and we'll get there slowly. So generally, if you've been doing well and you have a major flare up like this, just slowly get back on the horse. What we don't want you to do is just go into this avoidance mode of doing no activity at all. We do want to slowly, as things recover, as it calms down over a couple over a couple days, I want you to start regaining your function. So I don't want absolute rest here. Um, you really can't do absolute rest, no, no bed rest. If you need to do bed rest here, um, keep it at a day or two, and then slowly start to do a little bit more. Um, and if you've been doing well, these are going to be short-lived. If you're still down here, yeah, the flex will last a little bit longer. Um, so I'm just going to introduce you to this chart. Um, we, uh, Brittany Kim and I, um, who is someone that I used to work with, um, with your presentations. Um, we, we put together a poster presentation for CPTA uh, earlier this year, earlier 2020. And we, this is how we divided it up. So what you're going to see next is we're going to see this chart, but I want to explain this first. What we did on day one, um, what we did in the early phase, what we did in the middle phase, and what we did with the late phase. So remember I told you with the stair steps, we only kind of showed three stair steps, and there's a lot of little ones on the way. But this is just how we explained it in this chart. And then we're dividing this into pain neuroscience education, how we're educating them. Uh, what we did with graded motor imagery, um, we don't. There's a lot of information on the web. You can go to www.gradedmotorimagery.com. We haven't really covered that in this lecture, but addressing biomechanical impairments. So even with CRPS, there's often strength limitations, joint restrictions, all that stuff. Um, we're talking about doing manual therapy here. We're talking about decreasing that sensitivity with um, to fabrics and light touch and how we kind of did that. And then down here, we're looking at how we did exposure with um, function um, and exercise. So kind of functional exercise is walking, running, um, standing, going from a wheelchair to, um, you know, to bed, stuff like that. Just all, all levels of function, how we progress from uh, not putting any weight on the foot at all to, in these cases, running. Okay, so we're gonna get into this a little bit more and talk about these two cases. Um, so first of all, um, these are two women about the same age. Um, one was ambulating with an AFL um, and crutches. Um, the interesting thing about this patient is she had no active ankle dorsiflexion um, and dropped foot on this side. So she was in this AFO. I'd tell her to lift her, her toes, and she couldn't do anything. And if you palpated the muscles there, there was no activity at all. Um, she had CRPS for two and a half months um, before treatment. So both of these are pretty acute cases. Um, we have other cases that we've gotten really good results with. Um, the reason that I picked these two cases in particular, and I've gotten um, gotten probably seven or eight patients with CRPS back to running. Um, I picked these specific cases because uh, I have good outcome measures. So we wanted um, the good pain catastrophizing scores, LEFS scores, um, uh, good notes on these patients. I'm I'm really I'm not, my documentation is not what I excel at. Um, so making sure that I have all these, um, all these scores and all these functional levels is, um, is important um, if we're going to, if we're going to talk about these people to really show what we did and how we, um, how we progress these people. Um, so this patient was in a normal outpatient, um, was in a normal outpatient program. 30 minutes, um, 30 minute sessions twice a week. Uh, we then went for four months and then we had a month and a half off um, and then they were seen periodically. So this 
be kind of your typical outpatient um, program. This was a multidisciplinary program. Um, so it took less time. Their sessions were also an hour in length. Um, so that, that does affect how quickly we're able to progress them. You notice the duration is much, much quicker with this. Um, they had psychotherapy, they had biofeedback, and then we kind of tapered down um, after these, this intensive physical therapy and rehabilitation. Um, what did we do? So we introduced the neurophysiology of pain um, and pacing. So we introduced these concepts. We, we talk a lot about, um, again, de-threatening what pain is and understanding it so it's not as scary. And then we, t we explained to them, we put this under pain neuroscience education because we're, this is the education about pacing and graded exposure. So that, that information that I shared about you, about how we slowly do more, we share this um, and educate them on how to do this on their own and how we're going to progress this in the clinic. So this, this becomes, this gets applied to not only um, what we're doing in physical therapy, but they start to apply this to their whole daily life. Um, we talk about um, self-management. So uh, JB here, um, she would, um, she would have less pain when we did nerves glides and nerve stretching. Um, and um, she tended to kind of go into these boom bust cycles where she just pushed too much. So there was a lot of education on um, using nerve glides to decrease symptoms, um, taking rest breaks, stuff like that. I'm kind of in this early phase here. Um, SS. Uh, she would she would use all these this colorful language explaining her symptoms um, and it was it was kind of threatening language some of the some of the things that I've heard is it feels like a volcano is um, coming out of my leg we we think that those metaphors that we use and that visual imagery we think that that actually can increase the threat to the nervous system um, so we want to use neutral language um, again focused a lot on pacing and what to do when she flared up a lot of education on how to manage um, symptoms um, on our own. Um, introduce like functional activities. I don't know if it's on here, but you know, starting to wear shoes and stuff like that. I think that's down below. Um, and then eventually, you know, we get them to, to understand, oh, this is how I do this on my own. This is how I apply this on my own. So graded motor imagery. Um, I don't, I think we started like halfway in with these two individuals. We didn't do, um, we didn't do the uh, laterality training. We didn't do explicit motor imagery. Oh, I guess we did do, we did some explicit motor imagery. We did do some imagining of walking. We did do an imagining um, activities. I'll often go from laterality to explicit motor imagery, imagining doing things to back to mirror box and then keep doing the imagining. Um, activities with lower extremity. So if you have a foot or ankle or knee issue, tear pants issue. I'll keep doing this imagining movement um, for a while. And the reason is because uh, I feel like you can do more threatening activities. Um, you can imagine doing more threatening activities than you can do in a mirror. So you can imagine running, but you can't very well um, replicate um, running with a mirror box. So we keep doing this imagining for a little while, um, even after we've started to do other activities. Um, so we start to do, um, so, oh. so again, there is some tissue, um, there's some tissue tightness, there's some joint restriction, stuff like that that we need to address um, often with CRPS besides just the central sensitization. So we will find um, that soft tissue mobilization, joint mobilization, uh, nerve stretching, and then again, progressing to uh, instrument assisted soft tissue mobilization, what you saw me do with that little metal thing. Uh, we did some joint manipulation and we did some taping too. So that cuboid whip that you saw me do 
on the video, we did that um, as well. Again, that other video that you saw where we started with uh, desensitization of let's touch the other foot, then let's touch the affected side. Um, two point discrimination, that's that tactile discrimination that I was talking about earlier. Weight bearing training. I don't think we used, I wasn't using the scale um, when I was treating these patients. I just hadn't thought about doing that yet, but this is, this is really helpful down here. And then the intro to the plyometrics, that's on the reformer. That's the jumping on that thing. And then we did the jumping. So this is everything that we talked about. Uh, we also did graded exposure to wearing different types of shoes. Um, so if you can't wear heels or something like that, we'll have you wear them in your house for five minutes. Uh, or if you can't wear clothes for shoes, wear them in your house, take them off after five minutes. Wear a sock for five minutes, take it off. And then slowly progressing back to doing that all day. So the end result, um, so we're going to look again at these two cases and where did they, where did they go? Um, so we got JB, remember she had drop foot and no active dorsiflexion when we started. She regained five out of five um, ankle dorsiflexion, so the tibialis um, anterior tested five out of five at the end from not working at all it, it just started working. It's miraculous to me when that happens. Um, I, don't, I don't quite understand what's going on um, when we get that. Sometimes we see that with nerve stretching. Sometimes we see that with mirror box, that those limbs that just you don't have any activity in, they start working again. Um, she didn't need the AFO at the end. Uh, she had that full ankle strength back, um, and she was running 35 minutes in the community with minimal pain. Um, her initial pain catastrophizing score, this wasn't that high to begin with, but it did drop. So her fear level dropped. Uh, functional capacity increased tremendously. So we went from 41% function to 72.5% function. This is huge. This is, this is huge. And this is on the LEFS. Um, you know, functional almost doubled. Uh, and I would say it more than doubled. Um, she was using uh, crutches and an AFO and we had her back for running. I would say it more than doubled, but the scores almost doubled. Um, SS wasn't putting any weight on the foot at all. Um, and she was using a medical scooter. And we progressed back to uh, running 20 minutes on the treadmill with minimal pain. Uh, she didn't want to push it, so she decided not to run on flat ground. She might be now, I don't know, but she just decided she was going to give that up. We, we said she could, it was her option, and we thought that she could get back to running in the community, but she decided not to, so we were stuck with that. Um, not a lot of pain catastrophizing in the begin with, to begin with, but that did drop to zero at the end. She just wasn't afraid of it. Um, we used a different outcome measure here. But we, again, it more than doubled. Um, the sports scale was zero. And, you know, at the end, she had 66% function in sports um, activities from zero. Like she wasn't putting any weight on the limb, and we got her back to running 20 minutes on a treadmill with minimal pain. Uh, as I said earlier, I have more patients than this that I've uh, gotten back to, to running. Um, and some of them had symptoms for more than a year. So this isn't just an acute patient. Um, this, this doesn't just happen with acute pain, uh, with acute CRP patients. Some chronic pain patients can respond this way too. The reason I picked these two is because uh, I had good data on them at the beginning, middle, and end. So we, we presented this on a poster and uh, me and Brittany want to write this up as, uh, as a research report. A special thanks to Brittany for all her help, and we're done for today. Thank you very much. I hope you guys learned a lot and got a lot out of this.